one, but I shall just put my microphone on. There we go. So we're in Acts chapter 12 this morning. I'm going to deal with the whole of the chapter uh, because I think it holds together as one unit together. Uh, that, that we need to get to grips with all the way through. Let me just read you that last little section before we get going uh, from verse 19 onwards, the second half of verse 19. So we've just heard about Peter's prison escape and he's come to the house, the, the prayer meeting in the, the household. Then Luke tells us, then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there for a while. He had been quarrelling with the people of Tyre and Sidon and they now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And they shouted, this is the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. We'll leave it there. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help this morning as we open your word. We thank you that it is a living word. That these um, stories that we read really happened. Uh, and that they are here for our encouragement. They are here to teach us, to teach us about more what you're like to show us a bit more about what we are like. And Father, we pray that as a result of hearing and taking these words to heart, that we will become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name's sake. Amen. Well, we've been working our way through the book of Acts for some time now. Uh, and this book then contains, I hope you're cottoning on now, is the story about how the good news about Jesus left Jerusalem and started on its way to the ends of the earth. How a little group of maybe 100, 120 Jewish disciples, and Mark, Jewish disciples, huddled in a little room in a capital city, uh, a vast, and from that a vast multicultural movement with churches planted all over the Mediterranean, Springs Fort. And so lately, we've got to that stage in the story, the last few weeks we've had, where we've seen the wall between Jew and Gentile starting to come down. So not just exclusively Jews, but the rest of the world. The rest of them are Gentile. And this is a massive deal. Even for the disciples who knew that Jesus had commanded them to take the gospel to all the nations. Go, says Jesus, make disciples of all nations. Even for them, this is, this is, this is blindsided them slightly, hasn't it? Because perhaps, I mean, I don't know what's going on in their heads. It's hard to know what people are thinking, isn't it? But perhaps they initially assumed that what Jesus really meant for them to do was to go into all the nations and call out the Jewish people from those nations and tell them about the Messiah having come. But but surely not actually to all of those unclean Gentiles, you know, people like you and me. That would, that's, that's a reach, isn't it? And so they were understandably, I guess, reluctant. There's a huge amount of cultural baggage here. So much so that when Peter starts this movement really going, God has to give him those three visions at the same time, same vision three times to get the message through him. But now that outreach to the Gentiles has started to get going, hasn't it? And we've seen already that a predominantly Greek, I guess, church has been established in the great city of Antioch. And it was at Antioch, we heard, that the disciples were first called Christians, devotees to the Christ, Jesus' people. Uh, I mean, uh, I guess for the residents of that city, they could identify Jewish people, but these were not Jews, so you needed another name for them, didn't you? And so they named them after the one they were following, Jesus, the Christ. And so now, we left it really by just making this comment that the only division now really in the scriptures between human beings that's recognized by God is this, is Christians and non-Christians. That is, there's only two types of people in the world, and it's regardless of colour or class or culture, 
those who are devoted to Jesus, those who are not devoted to Jesus. Those who are in Christ, those who are not in Christ. You're one or the other. And in the very next story that we've got here in this chapter, Luke's recording for us, uh, we, we see this, the kind of clash, actually, that is going to happen between these two groups uh, and will continue to do so and characterise the age that we're living in, this gospel age, a clash between those who are followers of Jesus and those who are not. And the first point I want to make this morning is, is a simple point. It's just that the world, the world hates Christians. <laughs> the world hates Christians. Uh, they hate in different ways, of course, and in different amounts, but they hate Christians. It's a principle. H have a look at these first verses. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And after arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to, the, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. And Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. It's an ugly scene, isn't it? We almost brush over the fact that one of the apostles, a key one, one of the inner three, has just had a sword put through him. Well, the Herod here is Herod Agrippa I. There's a picture of him there. And he was a nasty piece of work, as were, I think, pretty much all of the Herod dynasty. He actually came from this line, then, a long line of nasty pieces of work. His ancestors were, were all either completely bonkers uh, or evil or both. And his granddad, Herod the Great, was the Herod that tried to murder Jesus as a baby. He was a tyrant who successfully managed to kill his wife and three of his children, all because he thought there was some plot against him or something. Uh, he had murdered Herod Agrippa's dad. This Herod's dad had been murdered by Herod the Great. And Agrippa's mum here uh, sent him away to Rome to keep him safe. And here he became best friends with the emperor's nephew, Gaius, who later was known as Emperor Caligula, another exceptionally twisted and evil man. So this is not looking good, is it, this Herod? Uh, so Herod Agrippa I was one of the first Herods to be declared king in Judea since his granddad. Well, he was best friends with the emperor, so it's not surprising, is it? And the trouble was that the Jews, especially the important Jewish people, the religious leaders of the community, they didn't like him much, as, you know, especially didn't like him being king of the Jews because, well, essentially he wasn't Jewish, actually. So I guess Agrippa's got this issue, hasn't he, of thinking, you know, life would go a lot easier if they, if they liked me a bit. I wonder if that's what's going on here. And so knowing what was going on in the politics of his kingdom, you know, the anti-Christian feeling going on, Herod finds an easy target. He's going to go for the Christians himself. Well, the Jewish authorities had tried to stop these Jesus followers, but their numbers keep growing, and we've seen it exploding, haven't we, in Jerusalem and then bursting out of Jerusalem. So the religious leaders here hate the Christians, and no doubt they've also heard now that this movement is accepting Gentiles to come into it. I mean, that's just adding insult to injury. They don't even require these Gentiles to be circumcised or to keep foodness, food, food laws. I mean, where's the madness going to end? This will corrupt the whole nation. And perhaps Herod then thinks, you know, with all this ill feeling towards the Christians, he can lend a hand and win a few friends. So he has some of them arrested, he, uh, he, as we just said earlier, he executes the Apostle James, puts him to death with the sword. And it's a slightly sick sentence, really, verse 3, isn't it? When he saw that this pleased the Jews. You know, really pleased about seeing James uh, put to death. So he proceeds to seize Peter as well. And the, the irony here is it's nothing personal, it's just politics. You know, it's just politics. And seeing how well it worked, Herod's got... Peter and put him in, in prison and we actually read there there's 16 guards in place to make sure that nobody from this Christian community tries to do anything heroic 
And the plan is then to wait until the Passover celebrations are finished and then give him a public trial, and we all know how well those work out. I wonder how Peter felt. How's he feeling sat there in prison? This is the third time, by the way, that he's been in prison. And it's note, and I think Luke's drawing our attention to this on purpose, it's on the anniversary of the death of Jesus. Passover's approaching. The anniversary of that fateful day when Peter himself denied his Lord. When he pretended he didn't know him to get out of trouble for himself. When he was brought to his senses painfully as he hears the cock call crowing in the night. And now Peter himself faces execution. This time he will face the music. This time he's going to be true to his Lord. Now this is not something we live in fear of, particularly I don't think in the UK, is it? There's no mad despot waiting to run us through with a sword. No one's trying to kill us off so they can win a few votes. Not yet, anyway. But let me, let me remind you again. And the scriptures are very clear on this. Persecution is to be expected, isn't it? You know, I can... It, it, the persecution can come in all kinds of formats, can't it? You know, I mean, we moan maybe about very superficial things. But be sure, if you are really making a stand for Jesus, persecution will come. Paul told Timothy that in fact everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I think sometimes we forget that, don't we? We hope it's not true. Jesus actually himself said to his disciples, you know, not, not long before this incident we're reading about, he, and this is including Peter, he said this, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever's given to you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a child his father. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. Hence my first point. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So persecution is to be expected, and it will become, it will become in, in many forms to us, won't it? Betrayals or, or disappointments, friends who turn on you, colleagues who ridicule you for what you believe, and you young people. Perhaps you already know a little bit about what that looks like to be put under that kind of pressure in your schools. Being the weird one who goes to church. Clearly, you know, first, as soon as they hear that you're serious about what you believe, you must then be naive, bigoted, and homophobic. And you'll get that thrown at you constantly. I actually, I remember being so sensitive as a child when my friends came to tea and my dad gave thanks for the food before we ate. And I thought, would think to myself, my friends are going to think I'm a weirdo. I'll never see them again. The reality is, you know, for us here in the UK, if we live godly lives, and if, and it's a big if, I suppose, if we faithfully share the gospel with our neighbours and our friends, one of two things will almost certainly happen. They'll either, I mean, praise the Lord if they do, they'll, they'll join us, they'll want to know more, or they'll start to hate us. They'll start to, they'll start to turn against us. Why is that? Because the Christian message, faithfully preached, declares that people are ruined, that they are helpless sinners, corrupted from the inside out with no hope of fixing themselves or redeeming themselves before God. That's a harsh message, isn't it? Nobody wants to believe that about themselves. The Bible faithfully taught tells men and women that whatever else they are putting their confidence in, if it is not Jesus alone, it's going to fail them. And that's offensive stuff. And people will hate us for saying it. The reason people hated Jesus, and he actually explained, had to explain this to his brothers. It's in John chapter 7. The reason, he says this, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify 
that what it does is evil. There's the reason. It's offensive, isn't it? That will generally, I think, be the reason why we are hated in the end. We testify to the wickedness of the world, don't we? It's exactly the reason why these disciples were hated. Jesus said, you know, a servant's not above his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Well, the Jews thought, and this is the culture then that, uh, that they were living in, and it's not that far from where we are. The Jews thought they could put their confidence in what they did, yeah, in, in what they were like, in, in the fact that they kept the law, they were law-abiding. They thought that they, you know, there was a special privilege in being a proper Jew, circumcised, doing all the feasts and sacrifices, avoiding unclean things. But the disciples were saying, and even if they weren't specifically saying to them, it, it was being seen within the church, wasn't it, that no, <laughs> repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what you need to do. So you can understand the persecution, the hatred. Now, you and I have a choice if you're a Christian. You have a choice. And you'll do one of these two things. You'll either blend in and become bland. You know, as Jesus calls it, sticking a cover over your light. Your light as a Christian. Just pretend you're not really different. Or you'll preach a message that avoids all the painful bits that might offend people. You'll either do that or you'll face the very real prospect of persecution for what you believe. But... Fear not, says Jesus. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's what we're to hold on to, isn't it? And so there sits Peter. He's in his cell. He's hated. But he's standing firm. And he's waiting. And the scariest thing, I think, about the world hating you is the feeling, isn't it, that you are so small. And how small must Peter feel at this point? So weak. And then you look at the world around you and the 16 guards guarding the door and great Herod and the religious leaders and everything stacked against you and you think, and they are so big and powerful. All the cards are in their hand. They have all the power. Or do they? I think that's what this whole chapter is really dealing with, don't you? When facing a crisis, we instinctively do one of two things. That's what the psychologists tell us. A reaction comes in by instinct. It's either fight or flight, isn't it? That's what they say. I wonder what your instinct is. Do you stand up for yourself or do you hide away? Do you run away? What will the disciples do? Peter is facing his doom and they take a third option, not just fight or flight. I'd like to suggest to you this is the right one. Verse 5, they pray. <laughs> it's a verse that stands out in the passage, isn't it? Peter was kept in prison, verse 5. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. This is where Luke's leading us, by the way, isn't it? You know, you've got this disaster coming around us. And where's the church? They're praying. They're praying. It's a very strange thing how slow we can be to turn to prayer sometimes. Usually, though, a crisis gets us to our knees, doesn't it? And, you know, in our heads, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm all out of options. What can I do now? What can I do? All I can do now pray we shouldn't think like that should we but by instinct we want to go as far as we can on our own before finally saying okay i can't do it god please help me now yeah but surely prayer and we must get this prayer needs to be the first thing that we do it needs to be our first course of action why because though we might not think it at the time it is far more effective than any of our puny efforts are going to be to fix any situation it used to be a great little rhyme that people quoted when I was a kid. The devil trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. And that's what you're seeing in this story. It's true, isn't it? There's the power, not in us. This story shows us why the devil trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. The church in Jerusalem are earnestly praying for Peter. Older translations say... Prayer was made without ceasing for him. It's a long prayer meeting. The church is no doubt gathered in homes all around the city. We're told about one of them, aren't we? And they're constantly in prayer for Peter right through the night. That's what the evidence suggests, isn't it? 
And it's so comforting to know that we can bring everything to God by prayer, isn't it? Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and it was probably quite radical at the time to pray to God as Father. Yeah? Father. Fathers are supposed to be providers, especially in that culture. You're, you're, you're bringing requests to the, the one who you ought to look to to provide. They're the ones a child goes to with, with their needs. And we are to go to God like children who are unable to look after ourselves, unable to provide our own needs, who need help to bring all our requests to, think, to him. You know, think about those verses we looked at last week you know, from uh, Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And I'd suggest to you that it is madness, isn't it, to know that the awesome God who made everything and who holds together the very fabric of the universe loves his children and they're not to come to him for help for the things that we need. Why would you do that? It's lunacy to think that you'd be better off going it alone, on your own. Now, thankfully, the disciples don't do anything so foolish. They take their problem to the right place. They bring their crisis to the throne room of the universe, and the king takes action. Well, in the next part of the story, verses 6 to 19 there, we have, and I've given it the title Prison Break, but, but actually it's not really a prison break, is it? There's no plot, there's no plans, there's no one digging tunnels or anything like that, there's no one going out into the yard and shuffling soil out of their pockets into the yard. It's not really an effort of anyone. The escapee, actually, in this story is unaware until it's all over, isn't he? But it is a brilliant story. There's Peter. I mean, picture him. I, I don't know what these cells would look like, but probably pretty nasty and dank and dark. And he's chained up with two chains, we're told. You know, Luke's laying it on, isn't he? Good measure, two chains. He's got a soldier either side of him. This is high security. There's even two more guards at the entrance to his cell. And suddenly there's a bright light in the night. And an angel appears. And he gives Peter a smack on the side to wake him. Quick, get up! And Peter's chains just fall off. The angel talks Peter through getting dressed. Do you see that? Put on your clothes. Now, come on, Peter, sandals. It's like, it's like, it's like working with a five-year-old, isn't it? And don't forget, you get put your cloak on, Peter. And then he leads him straight out of the prison. And it's like the doors are on automatic opening, aren't they, as they go out. And all the while, we're told, Peter thinks he's having a lovely dream. And the angel leads him past all the guards, through the gates, and out into the open streets of the city. And it's then that the angel leaves, and Peter suddenly <laughs> comes around. It all suddenly dawns on him what's happened. You can imagine him there, can't you? Oh, it's a bit fresh in the cell, isn't it? Has someone opened a window? And then he's sort of blinking and looking around. Wait, wait a minute, where am I? And verse 11 it captures his thoughts at that moment. Now I know, without a doubt, the Lord has sent an angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and everything the Jewish people were anticipating. And so I guess with some excitement, Peter heads on through the town and over to Mary's house where he knows he can find his friends. And he knocks, and we get that lovely story, don't we? Rhoda, the servant girl, comes to the door and answers the door. And she is so excited when she hears Peter outside the door there that she leaves him on the doorstep, goes back to the prayer meeting to tell everybody the good news. And I guess Peter's out on the street panicking and hoping no guards are going to come past. Peter's at the door, everyone. And no one believes her. <laughs> she is, after all, you know, understandably... She's a bit emotional with everything that's going on, you know. It's, probably, it's just probably just Peter, it's just Peter's angel. And so Peter perseveres with his knocking, and finally he gets into the house. And everyone, quite rightly, is astonished. You know, one of the problems with us is that often even when we do pray, we pray without really believing that God will act. Isn't that what we're seeing here? <laughs> We know God can do anything in principle, don't we? 
But sometimes we just think, well, it'd be a little bit silly to ask. Would he really? Will he? Would he? Can he? You know, C.H. Spurgeon, the great sort of Victorian preacher, once recounted a story of a student who came to him and he said this, I've been preaching now for some months and I do not think I've had a single conversion. Spurgeon says, I said to him, and do you expect that the Lord is going to bless you and save souls every time you open your mouth? No, sir, he replied. Well, then that is why you will not see souls saved, says Spurgeon. You know, if you're asking for the right reasons, it is never silly to ask, is it? And it's always right to expect God to answer. There always is. He will always answer. You are children of the King of Kings, after all. He's not going to ignore you. Oh, he might not give you what you ask for. <laughs> He'll probably give you something better. But we should always ask and know he hears and he will respond. Well, we're told in verse 18 that, and it's an understatement, I suppose, there's, suppose here, there's no small commotion the next day back at the guardhouse. The soldiers are panicking. What do you mean you've lost him? How do you lose a prisoner? Wasn't he chained to both of you? Weren't all the doors locked? Weren't the guards watching all the doors? And then we get this, I don't even know what to make of this next little sentence, that Herod has a thorough search made for Peter. I mean, it's, if he's not there, he's not there, surely. You know, perhaps he's in the cupboard. Perhaps we've left him somewhere accidentally. Where did we put the Peter? A thorough search, and they cannot find him. And so Herod takes out his anger at all of this on the guards, doesn't he? All the men responsible for the prisoner are going to receive the sentence the prisoner would have got. Execution. And for all his power, though, this, I think, is what we're supposed to see. Herod can stamp his feet and he can execute as many soldiers as he likes, but he's not really in charge. He's just like a big child having a tantrum. And that is something he's about to realise all too clearly. And that's why I think we have to include this last section uh, in the chapter here. Those last verses, verses 20 to 24, tell us the story of Herod's demise. It's very interesting. I, I told this story in a previous church. I did it as part of a children's talk beforehand. And I thought, how do I make this story come alive? And this is one of these wonderful characteristics of children. Uh, I went down to, uh, to a shop and bought a whole of these gummy worms you know, these sort of sugary worm sort of things, and told the story of Herod's demise being eaten by worms. And you're sort of thinking, and adults are like, oh, that's disgusting. And you bring out these, the, the kids are quite happy to eat one. Uh, you know, saying, who wants one of Herod's worms? And they're, oh, yes, please. They all come up to have a worm. But this is a brilliant story. And I think it's one of these stories that is, it's slightly gruesome because I think actually that, that Luke is enjoying telling this story. He's enjoying it in a boyish kind of way. Herod takes a trip to Caesarea. There's been an argument with Tyre and Sidon, we're told, but the people have finally come to ask for peace because they need Herod for food. So he's got them. He's what? They are here to grovel, and Herod is clearly loving it. He's the kind of man that loves a groveler. And so he puts on his best expensive royal robes, and he's trying to get out of the room and his head is scraping the door frame, probably. And he sits on his throne to make a speech. The people decide that they need to kiss up to him. Clearly they understand this is how you need to approach an egomaniac. And so they, they lay it on really thick, don't they? Verse 22, oh, this is the voice of a god, not a man. But verse 23, immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God... An angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Well, who's in charge? It's not Herod, is it? It's not Herod. He's defeated in the end, actually, by a parasite. Like his wicked grandfather, actually, before him, who, history tells us, his body rotted slowly away in his old age. And Herod Agrippa suffers this horrifically painful and humbling death from a crippling disease. I mean, because I, I don't know what these verses actually specifically mean. The, the details are too vague, aren't they? But it clearly means that Herod dies a nasty death. A nasty death. And it's directly at the hands of God, isn't it? He doesn't, he doesn't give praise to God. It's, you know, God is put as the one who executes Herod. 
that arrogant, proud Herod. And, you know, biblically speaking, what you're trying, what you've got here is this man who's really just sort of lifted himself up so high, brought down by a worm, the lowest form of life, biblically speaking. And Luke finishes the episode, and don't miss this, with the punchline of the whole thing, a contrast. Here you see man's opposition versus God's plans. Verse 24, look. Herod's eaten by worms and dies, but the word of God continued to increase and spread. That's what it's all about. No tiny, arrogant little tyrant will stand in the way of God's purposes. Of that you can be sure, brothers and sisters. Here is the reality. God is in charge. You may suffer persecution, you and I might, but God is in charge. It doesn't mean that we will be spared from suffering. James was killed. But it does mean we can be confident when, this, when all is said and done, though we might not see it at the time, God is in charge. What's going on? Well, let me close by bringing this together and give you three little applications. The first one is this, and we've seen it as we're going through. Just to remind you, persecution is inevitable. Now, the Bible makes no bones about that. It's going to happen. Our calling as Christians is to take up a cross and follow Jesus. I hope when you came to Jesus, you understood that, that you're called to take up a cross to follow him. It's often said in the Bible, persecution's to be expected, and so we need to hear it, don't we? The normal Christian life is one where people will not love us because they did not love Jesus. When we show people they're sinners, when we dismiss their goodness as having any worth in their standing before God, ultimately, when we tell them that Jesus and not them is the only saviour, when we tell them that that crucified carpenter of Nazareth is actually the judge before whom all of them will stand to give an account of themselves, well, some people will laugh, some people will get angry, some people will be offended, some people might completely ignore us. And even if the persecution isn't personal or physical, the world itself will always be against us and against the spread of the gospel. Satan hates to see the gospel spreading, don't you think? Obstacles will be put in our way, even perhaps on a global scale. But persecution, obstacles... Attempt to silence the church in whatever form it takes is inevitable. So, second point, prayer is indispensable. Prayer is indispensable. Go to your heavenly father in prayer. Please do that. Do that for the church. Do that for the gospel. He always hears. He always cares. He always answers. And we need to learn then the priority of prayer. I've said this before, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting illustration. We need to keep hearing this. We ought not to think of prayer, never fall into this, of thinking of prayer as some kind of hotline to ask God for extra cushions to make the lounge of your life more comfortable. That is not what prayer is for. We should think of it as a field radio with which we ask for support as we're in the trenches. That's how we pray, under pressure, in the front line, on our knees in prayer. Prayer is not a last resort. No, it's our secret weapon. It's the most effective thing we have in our arsenal. So are you engaged in warfare, fighting with the world, the flesh and the devil? We need to be, and prayer is indispensable. And when I read this chapter, I can't help but think, as I said before, you know, the author Luke is trying to put a bit of humour into the account. Think about it. Peter is woken by an angel who has to talk him through getting dressed and walk him out of the prison gates before he realises he's free. Apparently, not in his wildest dreams would God do such a thing. Or perhaps maybe only in his wildest dreams would God do such a thing. And at the same time, the church is earnestly in prayer for him, and yet they're so shocked to get an answer to that prayer that they can't really believe it's him at the door. It's more likely to be an angel than that God has answered our prayers. Brothers and sisters, let us never underestimate what God might do in answer to the requests that his children make. 
Let's pray with faith. The third point is that deliverance is guaranteed. Why? Because God is in charge. And we may not see it now. We may never live to see the enemies of the gospel in our age actually vanquished and defeated. But one day, every knee will bow before the real king, before Jesus, the king of kings. Here is the reality. Let me just close by reading to you Psalm 2. Yeah, it's a wonderful psalm because it, it gives you a look at the big picture. It takes all of this in from a bird's eye view. Listen to what David writes, Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will pronounce the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Probably the most popular psalm of the early church, don't you think? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this powerful reminder that though we might feel weak and small, especially in this age where the nations and even our own nation rages against you, shakes their fist at your king, yet you still rule as the sovereign over all creation. Give us courage, we pray, each day to be salt, to be light, a city on a hill which cannot be hidden, so that men and women and children might find salvation in you. For we ask it in the good name of our powerful saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.